my name is Adalbert Chang. Uh, I am a data engineer at Target, uh, which is a chain of big retail stores in the United States, if you guys are familiar. Uh, today I want to talk to you guys about this vague notion of uh, composition. Uh, so it's something I've been thinking about for the past year, and I've been trying to figure out how to communicate uh, what I like about functional programming and what I like about certain APIs, and I hope this talk does it justice. So I think a good place to start uh, for a talk called Simplicity and Compositions is to define what I mean by composition. Uh, composition sometimes feels like this thing that everyone sort of says, our code should be composable, it's, it's good when things compose together, but uh, it can be kind of a hand-wavy term, so I hope to uh, start by, by grounding us in, in something a bit more definite. So, so to start out with an initial definition of composition, uh, I'm going to focus on a type or a set of values. So you can think about this type as uh, integers or strings or lists of things. And then I want a binary operation on that type. So it's going to take two things of this type and produce another thing of the same type. So you can think about addition or string concatenation. Uh, moreover, I want some sort of identity uh, element of that type. So uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. And we want these things to follow a certain set of behavior. So the first thing we want to do is make sure this, uh, make sure the operation is associative, which means combining x and y and taking a result and combining with z should always give the same answer as combining x with the result of combining y and z. And the second one we wanted to follow is that identity acts as identity, both left and right identity. So x should be the exact same thing as x combined with identity, which should be the exact same thing as identity combined with x. So some common examples of things that follow this structure will be the integers with addition and zero. You could also do multiplication and one. Uh, if we're on, say, a machine, you could take the maximum or minimum between two integers, and then the identity would be uh, int.min value and int.max value, respectively. Uh, we can also think about lists of things. So lists of some things, uh, list concatenation will be your operation. So we'll just take two lists and smash them together. And then empty list will be your identity. And maybe a slightly more interesting one is uh, functions where the domain and codomain are the same. Your composition there is going to be function composition. And your identity is going to be uh, that identity function, which will just take the input and always just give you, uh, just give it back to you immediately. So uh, there are other very, there are other instances of, of these things. I gave sort of simple examples. Perhaps more interesting ones are uh, a certain class of retry policies will form a monoid. So you can, if you think about retry policies as maybe a stream of uh, durations where each element of the stream indicates how long to wait before the next retry, and then uh, the, the composition between two retry policies will be position-wise taking the maximum retry time, and then the identity would be just immediately always retry. So it's kind of a variation on the uh, integer maximum monoid. But uh, there's a lot of, in lot of instances of, of monoids. And being the good programmers that we are, we're going to abstract it out into an interface or a type class. So monoid is uh, the name comes from abstract algebra, describes pretty much uh, you're out of set, you got an associative binary composition, and you have an identity, left and right identity. So everything I'm about to say is going to hold for any monoid you choose. I'm just going to talk about integers because that gives me something concrete to talk about. So given a list of integers, uh, there's a, one thing we can do with them is sort of be boring and just go from left to right and slowly reduce it down using the composition operator uh, into a single summary value. But that doesn't really leverage any, anything that monoid gives us. So something a bit uh, fancier we can do now, because we know the composition operation is associative, that basically means we can group, uh, we can partition this list into subsets, basically, and then solve the problem for each subset, and then work our way up from there. So maybe we partition this list into chunks of two, and we solve the problem for each chunk of two, and then we take those results and solve that, and then we keep going until uh, we get our final answer. So uh, I've drawn this diagram on purpose, sort of like uh, sort of like a software stack architectural diagram uh, for a reason. So one way we can think about it is we've, we started with a bunch of small problems, and then we we folded it up uh, in sort of a modulary fashion, where we, we split them up into small modules and then, and then kept bubbling up. 
another way we can think about it is we started with uh, a big problem, and the, the problem here being 36, and then we split it up into uh, smaller and smaller components. So we split it up into the problem of 10 and 26, and each of those were split up into uh, small chunks. So what composition gave us here, uh, taking that view, uh, what composition gave us here is uh, at each sort of layer of this quote stack, uh, we we just had to, we were solving the same sort of problem, right? Just the problem of figuring out what the sum of one and two was is the same was the same as the problem of figuring out what the sum of ten and twenty six was. So composition allowed us to uh, think about the problem at both a large scale and at a small scale, and then associativity, which sort of seems like a an innocent law, something that doesn't really give you much, uh, actually allows us to reason about this in a very modular way. Because uh, without associativity basically tells us we can evaluate sub-expressions uh, in any order we want. And uh, this allows us to say, reason about just uh, the quote module under 26 uh, as an independent thing, independent, like without having to think about how it acts in the global, in the more larger computation. Um, one thing to note here is, uh, and I'll, I'll describe this more in a, in a better sort of modularly programming sense in a bit. But one thing to note here is uh, side effects, for instance, would not be compatible with this associative composition model because if, say, we were doing uh, writing to a database as part of our computation, if I evaluated uh, the right sub-expression first and that wrote to a database and then evaluated the left sub-expression and that wrote to a database, the order I can observe the different... Uh, the different behavior of the, of the side effects. So, in, so sort of side effects are incompatible with uh, this associative composition thing, and that's one of the reasons why uh, functional programming is, uh, and composable programming is very much about uh, staying away from side effects as much as possible. So yeah, uh, associative composition allows us to get modular decomposition. So decomposition uh, in the sense that I can take a big A and split it up into small A's, or take a s several small A's and build up a big A. Uh, and reasoning as the associativity part, where I don't have to care about the larger context, I can just reason about uh, one specific module. So, so far I've been talking about somewhat of a boring thing. I've been talking about adding integers, adding concatenating strings, concatenating lists. Uh, I want to do the same thing now, except talk about it in the more powerful, talking about programs, talking about modules. So instead of just talking about A's, I'm going to generalize into talking about F of A's. And uh, we can think about F as sort of the effect, or the program, or the module, uh, and A as the thing the module produces. So uh, F of A is a program that, pr that, for some notion of evaluation, will, may or may not produce an A when run. Uh, so you can think about f as future, as I/O, as list, as option, what have you. And so now we want to talk about composing programs. Uh, the first thing we might want to try is to just take two f of a's and get us back in f of a. But that's pretty much a glorified way of doing the exact same thing we were doing before. There's no, it's just everything's the same type. But what we can do now, now that we've split this thing up into a type constructor and the type parameter is we can fix the type constructor. We can make the type constructor constant, and we can vary uh, the type that we get back. So given an f of a and an f of b, the f's going to be the same, but the a and b may or may not be different. Uh, we want to get an f of another thing back. And uh, the simplest kind of thing we can do is to just pair them up together. And from there, we can do things like map over f to actually turn that into a useful value. But we'll just talk about uh, pairing them together for now. So let's do the same thing uh, we did before. So we're going to focus now not on a set, but sort of as a, uh, we're going to focus on a type of program. So maybe we're just talking about uh, programs that do I.O. or programs that may or may not produce a value, which would be option. And then we're going to want some sort of composition operator that takes two Fs and produces another F. In this case, it's just going to take an F of A and an F of B and pair them together. And then we're going to have this quasi-identity function that I'll show more why is actually is more like an identity, but uh, this is going to act as our identity function similar to how we had an identity for uh, monoids. So this will be eta that takes a plain A and we'll just wrap it up in an F. And we expect this to hold certain uh, have certain behavior like before. So we expect this composition operator to be associative. So combining f of A with f of B and then combining with f of C, 
should be isomorphic to f of a combined with f of b combined with f of c. And in this case, I say isomorphic to and not equality because due to the way we've defined the composition operator, the nesting of tuples is going to be different. Uh, but the amount of information it carries is going to be exactly the same. You just have to sort of reassociate the parens. Uh, and then we also want the identity to be an identity. So f of a should be isomorphic to f of a combined with uh, the unit value lifted into f, which should be isomorphic to the unit value lifted into f combined with f of a. So some examples of this uh, for option. Uh, so I'm, I'm calling it zip here, but for certain things, it might not act like the zip you think of, but uh, absent a better name that would fit on the slide, I'm going to call it zip. So for options, this is going to be, if both of them are sums, we're going to pair them up together. Uh, if, n if either of them are none, then we just propagate the none through. So this is sort of composing two programs that may or may not produce a value. And if one of our programs can't produce a value, then there's, the composition is going to be a program that doesn't produce a value, so that makes sense. And then our, our eta or our peer function is going to just take an a and wrap it up in a sum. For lists, uh, the zip operation is going to do the Cartesian product. Uh, and then the peer is going to just wrap it up in a singleton list. So you can think about list, in this case, as a program that produces a, a, a bunch of possible different values. So maybe something like a non-deterministic uh, set of values. And so for each possible value that the quote program produces, we're going to compose it with another program that produces uh, another set. And then uh, a more interesting one will be function, which uh, our f is going to be uh, the functions from x to blank. So we'll have an x of a and an x of b, and we want to produce an x of the pair a, b. And we can do that by just applying each function uh, to the argument. And then pure will just take a plain value and uh, just ignore the argument and always give you that value back. So as before, uh, being the good programs that we are, there's going to be a lot of different instances of this thing. And so we're going to abstract it out into this thing called uh, monoidal, named after uh, lax monoidal functors, something from category theory. But uh, basically, it's going to be things that support zip and pure and have associative zip. And uh, pure X more or less has an identity. Uh, if you look at libraries like Scalazit or Cats, or if you look at Haskell, this will more often be called applicative. Uh, they are basically the same thing. Uh, I just chose this one because the laws, uh, the associativity law and the identity law mesh nicely with what I'm trying to get at today. Uh, if you look at the, if you go and Google what the applicative laws are, you'll see why I chose to ignore applicative. And in, uh, in this formulation, we'll also generally have a, a map as well. So that'll be the thing that we can reach into the f and map the pair a, b into something more useful. So uh, similar to sort of the, the architecture diagram that I talked about for monoids for our summing integers, we can now talk about useful programs. So maybe we're generating a, uh, a, a welcome page for a social network. And so at the top, we're going to say we want to generate some IO action that will render the, the welcome page for our social network. And we're going to split that up into two pieces. One, one piece is going to be the IO action that, uh, that draws the sign-up form, and the other will be an IO action that draws sort of the feature list of our social network. And then furthermore, we can split up sign-up forms into sort of the user input form and then password requirements. And then the feature will be a list of features and maybe like the latest post from, from the network. So these are going to be all IO actions all the way down. Uh, IO is monoidal in the sense that it does have this sort of zip operator. It's associative. Uh, and with that, we are able to say, when we implement featured, we just have to focus on how, how to draw a feature on the page uh, or give back information about our featured subsection of the page without having to worry about what the, the larger context is. Uh, and similar for sign up form. And a composition, again, gives us, uh, when we render our welcome page, we just know I have an IO of a sign up form and an IO of a featured, and I just have to worry about how to compose them together. And that prob and it's the same problem all the way down. So, so far I've been talking about uh, composing programs, uh, sort of if given an f of a and an f of b, how do we compose those together? But the specifically, we're talking about composing independent programs. Why are we talking about independent programs? Because if we think about, uh, going back to the example here, say, 
drawing the signup form and drawing the featured form, we have those programs ready, right? The Fs are sort of the inputs to the function. So we can't do something like uh, render a user profile for a given user, because that requires uh, data dependency. Uh, so if, if I wanted to do that, uh, the, I would be given something like a username, and then I would have an IO action that produces a user ID associated with the username. And then, so I would have an IO of a user ID, and then I would want something that, given a user ID, would produce another program that would draw user-specific information. But I can't encode that given this because I sort of have the, the signature suggests that these programs are independent. So what we really want uh, is something that can depend on the result of one program. So we, can, we want to be able to produce a program that depends on the result of some program upstream. So we can think about it as f of a, which is a program that produces some a, so maybe a user ID. And then a function that, given the user ID, will produce uh, the page associated to that specific user ID. And then at the end, we want to get our, our actual page back. So maybe if we, if we make this more concrete, we can have an IO of a user ID. And we have a function from user ID to IO of user profile. And then uh, combining those together, we get just our user profile page. So as before, we're going to talk about uh, Fs, which is our, our, the type of our program. And then instead of uh, our, we're going to change the composition operator now too. Instead of uh, sort of pairing them up together, is given an f of a and then a function from a to f of b, get back an f of b. Uh, we'll call this flat map or bind. And then we'll have the same sort of quasi identity function that we'll get to in a bit. And then the laws we expect to hold now uh, will be uh, flat mapping f of a through f and then flat mapping through G should be the same as flat mapping F of A through the composition of F and G. Uh, and I have in the, uh, as a footnote there, it's not the same kind of function composition because F is going to be something like A to F of B, and then G will be something like B to F of C. So the codomain and domain don't quite line up. But because we're talking about, uh, because we have flat map, basically, we're able to still compose those. I mean, I'll get into some details on that in a bit. Uh, our identity laws also change a little bit. So if I take a pure value x and apply f to it, where f is going to be a to f of something, that should be the same as lifting x into f using uh, pure or eta, and then flat mapping through f. And uh, the other identity law will be given an f of a, that should be the same as binding f of a through pure or eta. So some examples of this. Uh, so for option, uh, I think is a good example. So we can think about the, the OA as a program that may or may not produce a value. And then F is going to be, if the program upstream produces a value, this is what the next program is going to be. So clearly, if the program does produce a value, we have the next step of our program to execute. And if the, the upstream program doesn't have anything to give us, then, uh, then we have nothing to give back. So now we begin to see sort of the data dependency portion, a contrast with uh, the, the zip version, where we had to just Paired them up. Uh, list is going to basically for each possible output of the program, uh, it's going to apply this apply f to that element. So you'll get another list of possible values. So you'll have a list of a list of possible values, and then just concatenate them all together. So basically, this gives us uh, given a program that has a variety of inputs, we can get back a uh, and a function that. Given one of those inputs produces another program that produces a variety of outputs, we're going to get back all the possible uh, variety of outputs we can get. And then the function one is a bit uh, interesting. Uh, so you can think about functions as programs that will read from some value. So this, val this reading from some value will be reading from x, so x is the input parameter. So given a program that will read from some sort of context uh, and produce an A, and a function that takes that A and produces another program that will read from that same context and produce a B, we want a larger program that, uh, given that same context, will produce a B. So the way this is going to work is uh, we'll first figure out what the A value is by, by applying uh, f of A to x. So that'll, give, that'll get us the A value that the program produced. Uh, we'll apply f to that to sort of get the next step of our program. And then we'll give that thing the context to get the actual B back out. 
And as before, being the good programmers that we are, we're going to abstract this out uh, into this thing called monad. So when functional programmers talk about monad, they're basically talking about things uh, composing dependent programs, effectively. Uh, and sort of as a side note, uh, anything that is a monad will admit a perfectly fine uh, applicative or monoidal. So you can think about this as composing dependent programs is more powerful than composing independent programs, which makes sense. Uh, some of you may have noticed that for when I talked about monoid and uh, monoidal, there was a very nice parallel between the two in terms of we talked about a set of things, we had this associative binary operation, and we had a left and right identity. And then I started talking about monad, and then the laws became really weird, and the composition operator became really weird. So let's fix that. Uh, if we sort of take a step back and monad, sort of the central thing that we care about uh, are these arrows that, given a, a plane or a peer value, produce an effectful value or produce another program. So maybe it takes a user ID and produces an I over user profile, or it takes, I don't know, uh, a, a string and, and just indexes into a, a database, an IO action for a database or something. And so we have all these uh, A to F of Bs and B to F of Cs, and this, the, the main thing we want to be able to do is to compose them together. And we can sort of reconcile this with the old definition where we had an F of A and an A to F of B by treating an F of A as just a function from unit to F of A. Uh, and so now, instead of talking about f of a's and a to f of b's, we're just going to talk exclusively about these kind of uh, effectful functions, and then talking about how we uh, composing these effectful functions. So, uh, composing an effectful, composing f with g and then composing with h should give back the same thing as composing f with the result of composing g and h, and composing and f should always be the same as f composed with the quote identity value, which should always be the same as identity composed with f. Right? And so this, this weird symbol, this greater than, equal than, greater than, is the thing that, uh, given an a to f of b and a b to f of c, gives us back an a to f of c. So we can compose despite the, the codomain and domain not quite uh, lining up. So now we can talk about uh, programs that uh, depend on some sort of user input or depend on the results of upstream programs. So now we can be begin talking about generating, say, a news feed for our social network uh, based on whoever's logging in. And so maybe our news feed is going to be uh, sort of the F that we're going to be talking about is, is going to be given a user ID to produce an IO of the news feed. And we'll split that up into the problem of given a user ID, get the profile for the user ID, and given a user ID, get the friend recommendations for the user ID. And then we can split those problems into getting user info, friends, so on and so forth. And so again, at each sort of, uh, from, from the bottom layer all the way up to the top layer, we're talking about the same sort of F, given a user ID, give me an IO of something. And the composition operator allows us to use this sort of same, comp same kind of composition all the way up. And then, because we required these things to be associative, uh, we don't have to worry about sort of the larger uh, scope of things. We can evaluate things in, in any sort of uh, grouping that we want. I just skipped a slide there. <laughs> uh, but sort of, so, so far I've been talking about monoids, uh, applicatives, lax monoidal functors, monads, and we've seen that they all sort of respect this. We're talking about something. We have uh, an operation that takes two of those things and produces another thing, and we have an identity, and we expect composition to be associative, we expect identity to be left and right identity. So it would be nice if there was some sort of overarching theme that sort of unified all these concepts, and that thing is going to be category theory. So a lot of times when people get into functional programming and people start talking about composing this and composing that, at some point, uh, inevitably, someone's going to start talking about category theory. And the reason probably at least for me, the main motivation for studying category theory is because it gives us sort of a unified framework for studying composition. And uh, we want to have, we want to be able to talk about composable programs in a sort of rigorous way, not sort of like hand wavy, uh, just say like, oh, programs should compose, but not actually uh, have a, a rigorous way of talking about composition. So category theory, uh, I'm sort of paraphrasing from a talk uh, I listened to or I watched a couple of weeks ago from Emily Real at ComposeConf. Uh, and she's uh, 
said category theory is effectively the study of the algebra of composition, and we care about composition. So let's see what category theory can tell us. So I'm going to talk about categories in the abstract sense, and then I'll sort of give a couple examples of, uh, of how what we discussed sort of maps on the category theory. So uh, category theory is going to be talking about these very abstract notions called categories. And every category is going to have some notion of objects. So you can think about objects as maybe types. Uh, you can think about them as graphs, maybe. Uh, these, can, these can be anything you want. Just depending on the domain that you're interested in, you can think about objects as that thing. And then if your, arrow, if your arrows are defined appropriately, uh, you could begin studying them in sort of a categorical sense. Uh, so in every category, we'll have objects. We'll also have arrows between those objects. These aren't quite going to be functions. Uh, when we do programming, most often they will be functions, but you can also, there, there are instances where they're not really functions. But each arrow is going to be, is going to have very similar functions like domain and codomain. And if the codomain of one function lines up with the domain of another, you can always get the composite arrow. And then we'll always have, for each object, an identity arrow that just starts at the object and ends at the object. Uh, and in order for this to be a proper category, we're going to require that uh, arrow composition is going to be associative. And we will require that the identity will be the left and right identity and is indeed an identity. Uh, and to sort of draw this pictorially, if you think about A, B, and C as, uh, as objects and F and G as arrows, we can always form the composite uh, of G and F. And then for each of these objects, we will have an identity arrow. So uh, let's talk about how monoids map into category theory. So I could say that uh, any category with a single object is a monoid and then just walk off stage, which is what some people do to me uh, when I was first learning category theory. But uh, I think the, the actual explanation is, is more interesting and enlightening. So uh, if we think about, say, integers, the, the, the integers with addition and, and zero as identity, um, and when we think about what my definition of category was, there was nothing in the definition that said I can't have multiple arrows starting and ending at a given object. So we'll have one object, and we'll just have a bunch of arrows starting and ending at that object. And think about these arrows not as functions, but now as each element of this, the, the monoid set. So uh, in the case of integers, think about x and y as 1, or as 2, as 3 as these actual integers. And uh, categories require that given any two arrows where the domain and codomain match, uh, we should be able to form their composition. So the composition between two uh, arrows here is going to be this monoid composition uh, that we talked about before. And then similarly, uh, the category is going to require for every object, so in this case just the one object, to have an identity arrow, such that it's going to be a left and right identity for, uh, with respect to uh, arrow composition that's just going to be the, the monoid identity that we talked about earlier. So in, in categorical language, this identity composed with x should be the same as x, which is, uh, and the way we define composition here is going to be sort of the monoid composition. And uh, we can see how, I, well, hopefully we can see that the category laws sort of map onto the monoid laws uh, appropriately. Here, I've started with an existing monoid and then sort of shown how that translates in categories. Uh, but we can also take a category of one object and, and map that back to a monoid because the laws, the requirements for being a category are going to be the same as the requirements for being a monoid if there's one object. Uh, now I'm going to talk about how monads look like in category theory, at least in sort of an intuitive sense. Uh, and this is more or less uh, for those who have seen Emily Reel's uh, comp, what was it called? Uh, categorical view of computation effects from ComposeConf. This is going to be a, a ripoff from her slides. Uh, but we're going to take the view of monads again as these arrows from A to F of B. And so we'll have an arrow A to F of B, and then presumably we'll have an arrow from B to F of C. But we can't quite compose those in the same way we did with, say, monoid, because uh, as I said before, the codomain and domain don't quite match, right? The, the, the codomain of F is going to be F of B, and then the domain of B to F of C is going to be B. So they're different. But what we do know is we have this, by virtue of saying this is, this is a monad, we have this thing that given an f of b and a b to f of c lets us get an f of c back. And if we swap the input arguments and then curry it, uh, 
uh, we get something that looks like given b to f of c, we get back a function from f of b to f of c. So now all of a sudden we have arrows a to f of b and b to f of c. Despite, that, despite the fact that the codomain and domain don't match, we can take the b and f of c and turn that into an f of b to f of c because of this flat map thing. So let's call that star, g star. Uh, and then we can now form the composition between the two. And we can do this for any, uh, any arrow in the sort of Cleisley category, is what it's called. And if we squint a little bit, uh, so right now we have a to f of b's, and we have this weird g star that goes from f of b to f of c. But if you squint a little bit and make the f sort of dissolve away, we can start talking about maybe these dotted arrows from a to b and b to c, uh, where uh, you sort of, for each of these dotted arrows, you substitute the codomain to be f of whatever that thing is. So f prime is an arrow from a to b, but in reality it's going to be an arrow from a to f of b. And uh, because we're, we're, we're in category theory, we want also for each object for there to be uh, an identity arrow that starts and ends in that object. So we're going to have this dot arrow that starts and ends in that object. But if we recall, if we recall our definition of what the dotted arrow was, uh, we sort of make the target be lifted in an F. So for each of these identity arrows, it's not going to be a to a, but it's going to be a to f of a, or b to f of b, and c to f of c. And this should begin looking familiar uh, because this was our quote identity function for uh, applicatives and for monads. Right? So that's sort of why we chose this thing as our quote identity uh, for, these, uh, for these things. So, so far I've been talking about uh, programs that live in the same sort of f. f has been the same for everything. So, uh, this, so user info will be user ID to IO of info, and then recommendations will be user ID to IO of recommendations. But more, what is more often the case is you're going to have different sort of modules are going to return different effects. So maybe one module will talk to a database, and you'll just have your f will be like. Uh, if you use Doobie, it'll be like connection IO or something. And if for something else, maybe you're calling a microservice or something, and that'll be an IO of something, or if you maybe you have your own free monad over that. So the Fs are generally going to vary. So uh, what do we do about that? So what if we have different monoids, different monads, etc.? What what does what I just had to say uh, say about that? So we can start with monoids. Uh, given a monoid A and monoid B, what can we do? We want to be able to, well, the sort of natural thing we want to be able to say is, can we compose those and for some definition of compose? And uh, sort of copying what we did earlier, the sort of simplest way we can do that right now is to just pair up the monoids. And this works out more or less position-wise. So if A is a monoid, and if A forms a monoid and B forms a monoid, uh, the pair A, B forms a monoid by sort of combining uh, position-wise, and the empty is going to be the empty for each thing in the pair. Uh, we want to be able to do the same thing now for programs, so for uh, lax monoidal functors or for applicative functors. So there's two ways we can, we can talk about uh, composing these. One is sort of the analog of what we just did, which is uh, taking a pair of f and g, except because f and g are type constructors, it's sort of pair lifted up uh, to the type constructor level. And this works uh, more or less the same way, uh, sort of position-wise. Uh, we take the first element of the pair, we zip it up with the first element of the second pair, and we do the same thing with the second element. And then for pure, we just uh, do the pure point-wise and then pair them up. So from this angle, we can say uh, if we had one program that produced uh, an I.O. of something, and then we had another program that produced uh, another program that produced, say, a list of something. We can still, we can produce a larger program that's sort of the pair of the I.O. and the list. So we get another monoidal thing back, and then we can, again, resume talking about associativity and, uh, and composition. Uh, another way we can compose, ooh, okay, so before we get into that, uh, this is why I Again, from not having a presenter view. But uh, we can do the same thing with monads. So sort of we can talk about uh, product composition for composing dependent programs. And this uh, works more or less the same way, uh, sort of position-wise. 
but the more interesting thing I want to get into is, uh, I guess, co nested composition. So uh, let's talk about not pairs of f and g's, but f's of g's of something. It just becomes useful to say, if you have something that just produces an IO of a value, and then you have another thing that produces an IO of an either of an error at something. So you have one thing that can never, that produces an IO action that doesn't fail, and you have one that produces an IO action that may or may not fail. And how do we, uh, how can we combine those two? So if it's just lax, uh, if it's a lax modal functor or if it's an applicative functor, uh, one way we can think about this is say if user input, uh, if user input is IO and password requirements is IO of either, uh, we want to be able to lift user inputs from IO into IO of either. Uh, so F is going to be IO and G is going to be either. And we have this sort of pure thing from being uh, applicative. So we can just map over to IO and then take that value and wrap it up into whatever pure for either is. And that'll sort of get us uh, IO of either and then we can start bubbling our way back up. So how does this work? Uh, so for applicative functors, it's going to work by uh, zipping the outer f's. So we have an f of g and a and f of g and b, and the only knowledge we have is f is uh, applicative and g is applicative. So we'll zip the outer ones first, and we'll map. So this is where map comes in useful. Uh, we'll map over to f's, and then we'll zip the inner things. And pure is going to be wrap it up in a g and wrap it in an f. So uh, let's see. So we can. So the way we can think about this is, I guess an example would be, if we we can talk about independent. So we, I/O is sort of like this one effect that we talk about, and then either is another effect, and the list is another effect, and we want to be able to combine effects together in a way such that the composition is still something that we can reason about in an associative composition way with identity and so on and so forth. So basically, the question is: Given two applicative functors, can we take their composition? For, uh, two different applicative functors, can we somehow compose them to get another applicative functor from which we can then reason about? And the answer is we can uh, through this implementation. So this is sort of the proof, if you will. Uh, now I want to do the same thing for monads, right? Because most interesting programs we, we're, we write are going to be dependent on some sort of user input. And this uh, does not work. So we can try to implement this. Uh, the signature will look like, given an f of g of a, and a function from a to f of g of b, give me the f of g of b. And uh, sort of the only thing we can do, the initial step, is to try to flat map over the f of g of a. So now the, the, the body of this flat map is going to expect some function that goes from g of a to, uh, in order to satisfy that return type, f of g of uh, or f of f of g of b, uh, and but we have so we need to get from g of a an f of g of b, uh, and the only way we can sort of get at the a inside the g is to just flat map over g again, but the flat map for g is going to expect a function from a to g of something, and the only thing we have is a function from a to f of g of something. So the flat map for g is not going to type check. So you can't do this in general. Uh, so the fact that we can't write this flat map given just the knowledge that f is a monad and g is a monad means that monads in general do not compose. And this is something that you'll often hear uh, people complain about, especially when we start talking about things like monad transformers. And if you start talking about extensible effects, uh, people who are talking about free monads uh, and freer and uh, f, uh, this is basically, those, those solutions are purportedly solutions to the fact that monads do not compose in general. but they have their own caveats associated with it. So the takeaway for this is basically, uh, if your program only ever lives in a single effect, uh, say IO or A to IO of something, then you, you can get all the nice associative composition properties I've been uh, talking about. But once you need to be able to uh, freely mix and match between two arbitrary effects, uh, unless your program is just talking about independent programs, uh, you are sort of, you sort of need to be able to, you have to hit that, so, so certain monads uh, will compose. So monad transform is all about, we're going to fix one of the monads. Say we're going to fix uh, option. And options can compose arbitrarily with any other monad. But, that, but you cannot say fix it to be IO, and say IO composed with any other monad. That doesn't quite work. 
So, uh, so, so that's so that's basically what I'm getting at. If your program is juggling a bunch of different effects and you want to be able to compose those effects into one big effect, and so using that one big effect build up your entire program, we can't quite do that because we can't write it generically unless your stack happens to be something that uh, that works out. So to sort of give a review of what I'm uh, what I've been trying to get at, uh, associative composition allows for modular decomposition and reasoning. So when we build our programs, when we build our APIs, we want to sort of build them in using things that uh, allow us to compose. So compose in a sense that given two things, gets us another thing, and then we want that composition to be associative so we can reason about them. Uh, and talking about composition, generally, if you're talking about composing uh, sort of plain first order values, uh, you'll want to use monoids. If you want to talk about composing independent pieces, independent programs, we'll talk about applicative functors or lax monoidal functors. Uh, and if you want to talk about composing sort of dependent functions or dependent programs, we'll talk about monads. Uh, and the reason why a lot of functional programmers have begun studying, or not begun studying, but have been studying category theory is because category theory gives us sort of a uniform language for talking about composition. And so anything we uh, people talk about in category theory, we can more or less uh, translate that to, uh, I guess, computation and see what that looks like uh, in a program. Um, if, you, if you're dealing with different monoids, then those, uh, you can take two different monoids and compose those into a bigger monoid. And then from there, you can sort of talk about the bigger monoid uh, for your program and get the associative composition niceties. Uh, same thing for applicative functors. So for independent programs, if you have two independent programs that work in different effects, uh, you can still compose those to get a larger uh, effect and uh, be on your way. But uh, if you're talking about dependent programs, uh, they in general are not going to compose. And sort of the next step, uh, I couldn't get into them today because of time limitations, but sort of the next step there is to look at what monad transformers are doing, uh, what this MT, uh, sort of a Google keyword for you guys will be MTL, uh, which will be Monad Transformer Library. And then you can also look into sort of the new, uh, I guess, hype train on extensible and algebraic effects. Uh, there was some links uh, that uh, talk about things related to, to what I've been talking about today. So, so this talk was basically inspired by this blog post by Gabriel Gonzalez, who is a sort of Haskell-y guy. Uh, I read his blog post like two years ago and sort of thought had been thinking about it in the back of my head and has resulted in this talk. Uh, Michael Pilquist has given... Uh, or has a series of blog posts on sort of the, the lax modal functors I've been talking about. Uh, I gave a talk at Bayhack this year uh, on applicative that sort of talks more about uh, applicative functors and monoids and how they compose. Uh, Emily Reel's talk, A Categorical View of Computational Effects uh, at ComposeConf, was uh, a really good talk on how, I guess, category theorists view uh, computation. And then if you want to learn more about category theory in its own right, uh, one book I found uh, really, really good that had good exercises and, and a lot of drill, sort of like hammering new concepts into, you, uh, into your head, is a book called Conceptual Mathematics by Levere and Chanel. Uh, but that's all I have for you guys today. I don't know if we have time for questions, but is John here? No? No, he's talking to the other room. Okay. Do you know how much time I have left, or if I'm over? I'm done. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. If you have any questions, feel free to find me, stalk me throughout the venue. I'll be here all week. Thank you. Thank you.